As 2004 rolled around uh, and before the first bear arrived uh, in January, uh, the Appalachian Bear Center, ABC as it was known then, uh, received the gift of a new office trailer from the Mountain National Bank. And there was a crew, which included our own curator, Tom, that tore down the old one that Daryl had uh, lived in when he was here and prepared the site for the new one. So the new curator, uh, Lisa Stewart, now with one year behind her, would uh, uh, have a, a new trailer there. And she would also face some new challenges in the coming year, which started right off on January the 25th with the arrival of a small bear who would make a big impression on a lot of people. And for some people who, uh, who knew about ABR uh, back uh, in 2004, uh, and this was really prior to uh, us uh, having Facebook, a lot of people remember uh, some of these bears that, that have come through in these years. Uh, a lot of folks would remember uh, Copperfield, which was bear number 55. But uh, there was a small bear that was spotted in a tree in a Townsend residence uh, backyard after they had heard some gunshots. So after about a day and a half, the mother had not returned and the little bear was still there and the residents became worried because there were some large dogs in the area who of course had noticed the little bear in the tree and uh, they were really worried that the, the dogs were gonna get the little bear. So when the resident approached the tree, the little bear was so frightened that he just climbed down the tree and into the arms of the resident. So, uh, of course, the resident knew that was not normal bear behavior, uh, placed him in a crate and transported him to the center. And the little yearling, uh, it was a yearling, weighed uh, only 16 pounds. That was very underweight for a yearling at that time of year. And he was placed into a holding area in the enclosure, uh, kind of like an acclimation pen, not uh, the ones we have now, but uh, that sat inside our wild enclosure so that he could be monitored. However, he managed to escape through an opening in the roof of it, and which thus the name uh, that Lisa gave him as Copperfield. And he found his way into the large wild enclosure and climbed the first oak tree that he found. So he let uh, the curator then, Lisa Stewart, know that you know he, he didn't like the accommodations she had given him in the holding pen and he wanted out in the wild enclosure. Of course, being a yearling, he was accustomed to being out in the wild, and so uh, a pen was foreign to him, and he didn't want to be in that pen. But once he was out in the wild enclosure, even though there were some concerns because he had descended down that tree and into the arms of the resident who rescued him, uh, he behaved like a normal uh, yearling is expected. He would hide in dens and behind logs and disappear whenever uh, the curator was around or whenever she came down to throw food, he would hide from her. So he spent his days uh, high up in the treetops and then he would come down at night when no one was around to eat. Well, on May the 10th of that year, there was a, a big event uh, in the Park Service. It was a ceremonial signing of a dam relicensing settlement agreement with Alcoa Power Generating Incorporated. And that was held at Calderwood Overlook in the National Park. And basically what that was, it called for the protection of, of about 10,000 acres of mountain land between the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and the Cherokee and Nantahala National Forest. So the event was attended by, there were politicians, conservationists, uh, all kinds of bureaucrats, and it had been a long awaited agreement of a, about seven years waiting for this to take place. But I can guarantee you that the people that were there, the thing they probably remembered the most was that the, was the day that the park chose to release uh, Bear 55, Copperfield, back to the wild. So I think we could all safely say that the highlight of that event was Copperfield performing his final disappearing act as he was released back to the wild. And when he was released back, he weighed a healthy 59 pounds. So the picture you see is uh, of him at his release uh, and his final disappearing act.
The next bear that came in uh, was in March, uh, March the 13th. There was a little bear that had been observed for uh, several days behind Timber's restaurant uh, here in Townsend. And the little bear was brought to the bear center and it took several attempts. Uh, TWRA officer David Sexton, who's still with TWRA today, um, he captured the little cub after a dog had treated it uh, at a nearby residence and he was able to lure it down out of the tree with bacon. So that's where he got the nickname that uh, Lisa gave him of Porky. The little cub weighed uh, 8.6 pounds and after being observed uh, for a little while in a holding pen, he was put out in the wild enclosure with Bear 55 Copperfield and to spend his days asleep in the treetops. And our notes at that time uh, talked about how much he loved sleeping high up in the tree. And this picture is an example of how these bears will climb up and find the skinniest limb way up in the treetops and sleep on it. That does not look comfortable to me, but that's, that's where they love to be. So uh, he quickly gained weight and became the largest of the, all the bears in the class of 2004 and weighed 125 pounds when he was released in September of 2004. Then on April the 6th, uh, bear number 57 arrived. Uh, TWRA officer David Brandenburg transported a five pound orphaned cub from Cock County, Tennessee. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Cock County, Tennessee, uh, the Newport, Tennessee, uh, which is nearby us, is in Cock County. And officer Brandenburg had exhausted all efforts uh, to locate a surrogate mother in the wild. He tried to find one uh, for this little cub but of course most of the mothers were already out of the den with their cubs uh, and in the notes uh, that we have from that time lisa stewart described the little guy as a spitfire and said that he was just a bundle of energy all paws and claws and uh, didn't didn't like to be held didn't like for her to um, be near him and uh a year earlier, Officer Brandenburg had brought uh, bear number 49 that we talked about before, Lucky, to the bear center. So this little bundle of energy was named Little Lucky. Uh, that's how she got that nickname. Uh, she had a real hard time getting him to eat when he first came. He refused the bottles of formula. You know, some of the little bears, they don't, um, they just can't get the hang of a nipple on a bottle. Uh, if you remember this year, the berry triplets, we had a lot of difficulty getting them on a bottle. And so finally she tried syringe feeding him and was successful. And uh, so he finally started eating. He was too small to join the other two bears, uh, Copperfield and Porky at the time. But pretty soon he would get some playmates of his own size. Uh, and then he was released back to the wild on September 16th and he weighed 69.4 pounds. I apologize, I forgot to switch the slide on that, so I'll get you. Uh, some of our pictures are from old newsletters and then there are some bears we don't have pictures. So you see a little picture here of little Lucky living up to his name of uh, all paws and claws. You can see those claws that are out there. And uh, as I said, Lisa described him as a little spitfire. In late April, uh, Maria Davidson with the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. And uh, Maria is still there in Louisiana and she's the uh, biologist that we've uh, dealt with for our current Louisiana bears and the ones we've we've gotten in the past year. Uh, so Maria's still there, but she had called about two cubs that they had confiscated from an individual uh, who had them uh, illegally. And the bears, they were not Louisiana bears. They actually originated from another state. Uh, so because they were not of the black bear subspecies, uh, that comprised Louisiana's wild bear population, they would not be able to go back there and be released in Louisiana. 
So that meant they would most likely have to be placed in a captive facility. Uh, so uh, she had to seek uh, permission from TWRA for them to come here because as we've told you before, if bears come here out of state, that state has to agree to take them back. However, this was a, a special circumstance. These were not bears that could go back into the population in Louisiana. Uh, so they were transferred uh, to the center uh, in order to have a chance to uh, possibly be released to a, a wild population, uh, and if not uh, releasable, to go to a facility. So after a long 10 hour drive, they, uh, the little hungry cubs uh, arrived here at the center. The little male, uh, Lewis, weighed 15.4 pounds and the female, Anna, uh, weighed 9.2 pounds. So uh, little Lucky uh, was able to have some uh, playmates with him. So they joined him in the holding pen and they, uh, the three quickly formed a fast friendship and for the next several months Lisa reported that they wrestled, they climbed trees, and they all grew in excess of 50 pounds. So even though uh, these two had been confiscated from an individual, uh, it was determined that they indeed were behaving like a wild bear should and their time here uh, was uh, successful, so they were able to be released back to the wild. Uh, they were all released uh, into the Teleco Bear Refuge here in Tennessee in mid-September. Just two days after the cubs arrived, South Carolina called uh, about a seven pound orphaned female. Uh, some dogs had treed the little cub near a grocery store there, and she had a slight head injury, but uh, was able to recover at the center. And she was also placed with little Lucky, uh, Lewis and Anna. And just like her enclosure mates, she thrived and grew into a healthy bear. She was also released in mid-September back to South Carolina and weighed 51 pounds at her release. And although we don't have a, a good picture of her, uh, all we have are the officers uh, uh, getting ready to, or actually bringing her to the facility from South Carolina. Probably one of the most famous bears, uh, one that a lot of people locally remember uh, from this time is uh, Bear 61, Chester. Uh, in July of 2004, Kim Delosier called Lisa with the report of an underweight yearling. Uh, the yearling weighed 30 pounds. Now in July, uh, that's uh, very underweight for a yearling. The bear was found at Cataract Falls uh, here in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and had an injury to his back leg and also some puncture wounds on his front paws. Uh, so it was thought that he had, of course, he had recently been through family breakup and, and weaned from his mother. So they thought that it was possible that he received those injuries uh, as the mother was trying to get him to go off on his own. Sometimes the mothers have to be uh, harsh with the yearlings in order to get them to disperse. So uh, when he arrived at uh, the Bear Center, he had a new haircut, of course, uh, because a third of his body had to be shaved for surgery and he was confined for six weeks before he finally got to go out into a wild enclosure. So uh, it was thought that he was progressing really well, and uh, but then his release date was approaching, so the UT vets wanted to examine him before they gave the all clear for release. So in early November, they uh, transported him to UT, did some x-rays, and that revealed that there were some more problems with his leg, that it hadn't really healed properly, and that he was going to have to have a second surgery. So his release had to be delayed. He had a second surgery. And, of course, he now weighed a much healthier 150 pounds. Uh, so he had to be confined again uh, to give his leg every opportunity to heal properly. Uh, he healed a lot quicker from the second surgery, and then uh, in December, 
was able to go out into a wild enclosure uh, and didn't even have a limp. He darted right out of the confinement pen and ran out into the enclosure. And Lisa Stewart, in writing about uh, Chester, described his behavior as frolicking and said that she thought that was the happiest bear she'd ever seen running out into that wild enclosure. And in order to give him every opportunity to recover, the decision was made to keep him over winter and release him in spring. So I know that sounds familiar. We've got a bear now, our, our Louisiana female, that broke her leg twice, and, and which is why she's staying over winter, just to give them a, a lot more time. So a lot of people have asked before, have we had any bears in our history that had to overwinter? Well, here's, here's one for you. Um, and then in early April, uh, Chester, weighing 161 pounds, was finally released, but this would not be the last time Kim Delosier would call Lisa about this bear. Uh, it was in late fall in 2004 that Kim got some reports of a bear in an apple tree at the Swag Country Inn, which is in Waynesville, North Carolina. And he was really delighting the guests because he was fiercely shaking the apple tree until all the apples would fall to the ground. And then he was laying under the tree and eating all of them until he was full. So uh, even though Chester wasn't being a nuisance, he wasn't bothering people or getting too close, uh, the fact that he was that close to the inn and to people uh, kind of bothered them and they thought, well, you know, we probably really need to, to move him. However, uh, after he uh, rid the tree of all its apples, Chester decided to move on and uh, no one ever heard from him again. So um, his story is a real good example of the dedication of our UT vets and, and our uh, wildlife personnel at the park uh, dedicated to make sure that all these bears uh, are taken care of and get what they need. And, and as I said, he's one of the bears that a lot of people uh, who knew about ABR back during that time uh, remembered him. He's one of the most famous bears that we probably ever had. Then on the same day that Chester arrived, there was another underweight yearling uh, that came to the bear center. Uh, this one was uh, bear 62, Camper. And he was captured in the park near the Chimneys campground and weighed 27 pounds uh, upon his arrival. Uh, this was a small male yearling and he was described as emaciated. And so he was placed in the pen with the cubs already here at the center and they readily accepted him. And pretty soon they were all playing, eating and dinning together. Uh, and he quickly gained weight, and then by mid-September, he weighed 89 pounds. He was ready for release. And one of the things that makes uh, Camper's story uh, so interesting is, at that time, there was a study uh, by some Chinese biologists uh, on the success of the Black Bear Rehabilitation Program here in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So these Chinese biologists, along with some personnel from the Memphis Zoo, came here and attended Camper's release in September. So when Bill uh, Stiver, uh, that uh, you hear us talk about Bill, who's now the chief wildlife biologist for the National Park, he raised the door of the transport crate and uh, Camper returned to his natural home, uh, probably totally unaware that he, had, he played an important role in an international conservation effort. Then in late August, again, Officer David Brandenburg with TWRA called about a sow that had been captured by park officers at Metcalf Bottoms in the National Park. And the underweight bear was found in a ditch eating poison ivy plants and was visibly weak and very starved. Uh, and upon her arrival here, she didn't have any apparent physical injuries that would explain why she was so weak. Cause of course her being in a ditch one of your first thoughts would be, was she hit by a car? But they just brought her here to recover and to spend a few days uh, uh, resting. She weighed 69 pounds, which was much less than the 150 pounds that they would hope that a sow at that time would have weighed. She was placed in the enclosure with Chester 
uh, spent a few days resting, eating and regaining her strength uh, and becoming acclimated to her new uh, surroundings. There was a little competition with Chester for uh, some territorial rights, but they eventually worked that out and became friends and were often observed running and resting in the treetops and foraging together. And uh, Lisa's notes said that when Chester had to be confined for his second surgery, uh, she discovered that Ivy and Chester were vocalizing to one another and seemed to uh, have uh, developed their own special vocalization so that they could communicate even though they were separated. And at that time, the superintendent of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Dale Dittmanson, visited the Bear Center and he witnessed uh, Ivy displaying uh, normal black bear behavior, but he remarked that he had never heard those kind of vocalizations from a black bear. And Lisa described those sounds uh, that Ivy made vocalizing toward Chester as singing. So Ivy in the history of ABR is kind of known as our singing bear. Uh, and then on a cold day in late December, a very healthy 158 pound Ivy was released. Uh, not even troubled by the freezing temperatures uh, because once she realized she was free again, she bolted from the crate and returned to the wild. So the year began with Copperfield Bear in 2004, named for the magician because he loved to disappear and hide from the curator. And then uh, by year, years in, all the bears were magicians uh, at release because they all quickly disappeared into the wild. So 2004 was another year that uh, showed the amazing resilience of the bears that came here, overcame a variety of obstacles, and of course also tested the resolve of the new curator, wildlife officers, and veterinarians.